so good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another program with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got some new faces in the crowd today, and so if it is your first time joining us here, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through like a gazillion live free interactive broadcast. This is just our fourth program of 2023 after over 500 sessions featuring scientists, explorers, amazing organizations and facilities around the globe. And it is so thrilling to kick off another new year with such amazing teachers and students around the globe. So thank you all so much for being here. I am your virtual adventure guide and I am so happy to have you back. Now, before we dive in with today's topic, which is one of my very favorite topics in the world, I will note we are going to do a little cahoot together today. So between the talk and the Q&A where we get to come to you for all your great questions, we are going to do a little four question quiz together with the link below. So if you want to pull up Kahoot.it, type in that game pin. I'll make sure that's in the chat for everyone in a minute as well. A good way to have a little extra fun and test your understanding too. But without further ado, I'm going to be turning over to Steph in a minute at the Toucan Rescue Ranch. So they rescue, rehabilitate, and re-release injured animals. They serve as an education hub showcasing some of the most amazing creatures in Costa Rica. And we have partnered with them on, I think, like 70 programs now over the last seven years. Students like you have helped raise thousands and thousands of dollars for their efforts to save these incredible animals. And today specifically, we are going to dive in with almost everyone's favorite creature, and that is the sloth. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the incomparable Steph uh, to take us away on a Toucan Rescue Ranch tour. I hope you guys are as excited as I am, and let's dive in. Steph, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Jesse. Hi, everyone. We're super excited, as always, to be part of these Exploring with the Seat of Your Pants. And today we are live from the Chicken Rescue Ranch in uh, Irelia. It's a nice sunny morning. And I would like to talk about one of our favorite animals here at the Toucan Rescue Ranch, which are sloths guys and i would like for you to understand a bit about the sloth biology but also to be able to understand the work that we do through the program saving sloths together so as jesse mentioned we have a great variety of animals but sloths are one of the animals that we have specialized in working in for a while now and we are going to see both our permanent residents which are animals that are here because they cannot be returned into the wild uh, and we have also some other sloths Oh no, we lost Steph for a second. <laughs> Sometimes when you're broadcasting from a phone in the middle of the Costa Rican rainforest, you can lose connection. Hopefully we get Steph back in just a second, folks. This doesn't actually usually happen with them, so fingers crossed she's back in business very, very shortly with us. I'm going to put her in the background while the connection gets going again. And I will note, uh, if any of you are keen to see more programs and some of the incredible stuff the Toucan Rescue Ranch features, head to our YouTube channel. Everything we do stays live there forever. We've done many more programs on sloths. We've got otters. We've got their incredible birds and so, so much more uh, all online for free and forever. And at toucanrescueranch.org, you can find out more about the incredible work that they do to save wildlife. So Steph's disappeared for a quick sec. Hopefully she's going to be back in soon. This is half the fun of video broadcasting. We've all lived through the pandemic over the last few years and something should go wrong in every video broadcast. Otherwise, are you really having fun? We're not really sure. Uh, so we're going to get her back in a sec. While we're doing that too, many of you have already joined our Kahoot. So please feel free to do that. We'd love to have you join in there. And it looks like we've got Steph back now. Yay! Because no one wants to hear me talk for half an hour. Yes, Steph, guys. welcome back. <laughs> Sorry about that, but we sometimes have connectivity small connectivity issues uh, here in Costa Rica. Internet is not what we hope for all the time. Uh, but guys, I am now here to show you one of our permanent residents uh, whose name is Pringle. Pringle is a Hoffman's two finger sloth. Uh, the scientific name is Cleopas Hoffmanny. Uh, and I'm offering uh, something, a little treat to my friend Pringle here, which is a little flower. Uh, Pringle, uh, sadly is one of these sloths that cannot be returned back into the wild. So he lives here as a permanent resident. He was part of the program Saving Sloths Together and we tried to rewild him, but due to a health problem, 
Pringle sadly has a problem where he regurgitates the food that he eats. He needs constant medical checks and therefore he cannot be returned into the wild even though we did try to have him go through all the stages of our program. Sadly now he has to stay here but here he has a forever home where we take the best possible care that we can of sloths like Pringle. But before I talk more about the program Saving Sloths Together, I would love for us to talk a little bit in general about sloths. These are really fascinating creatures that are widely misunderstood because a lot of people have this notion that sloths are really, really slow animals. And to a certain extent, I guess it's true, but I would like to debunk some myths because sloths are not necessarily slow all the time. They can be pretty quick. They can move in the branches as quickly as kids run on the ground. And when they feel threatened, they can actually throw those really, really big claws at anyone that is threatening them. And they can be pretty fires and pretty aggressive, be pretty fierce and pretty aggressive. So uh, the reality about this story that sloths are slow is that Sloths are actually the masters of saving up on energy. Why? Because the biggest part of their diet, and he's struggling to find that flower. Let me see if, come on, come on, Pringle. You can do it. It's right there. By the way, sloths have really bad eyes, eyesight, but a really good nose. So ha, he finally found it. So guys, what I was going to explain is that sloths are the masters of saving up on energy. We want to be more like sloths, to be able to do more with less energy. That is one of the goals that we humans actually have to save up on energy. And the reason I say this about sloths is because sloths, their main diet is actually leaves. They are in the suborder folivora, which makes reference to the fact that the biggest part of their diet is leaves. However, as you can see, my friend Pringle over here is having a little snack of this uh, hibiscus flower, which we have to be careful not to give too many of because it actually has a bit more energy than the leaves that he usually consumes. Uh, but uh, this helps me to explain the fact that there are two kinds of sloths and a very big difference between the two finger sloths and the three finger sloths, which we will try to see. We have a couple of baby three finger sloths. If they're awake, you may be able to see them uh, a little bit active. However, they were eating just a moment ago. But a big difference between the two finger and the three finger sloth is that two finger sloths have a more varied diet. As you can see, they can eat leaves, flowers, and from occasion, Okay, uh, they can eat things like fruit. They can also complement their diet with a little bit of protein. Uh, and therefore, their metabolism is a little bit quicker than the metabolism of the three finger softs that I will be talking more about in a moment. Um, so another thing that uh, is important to understand about this story of saving energy is that this is a very great good adaptation for animals like sloths that live in trees because they live in an environment where they're completely surrounded by their food. There's lots of it. Um, they don't have to be running after their food, but uh, because it brings in little energy, their super great survival strategy is not to waste any energy if they don't need to. So when a sloth needs to um, move, they will. But if it's not necessary, they actually will avoid doing it if they don't need to. They actually even don't spend energy on things that all mammals spend energy on. For example, thermoregulation. When I talk about thermoregulation, it's the ability that any mammal has to control its body temperature. We actually quite often call mammals warm-blooded animals, right? Well, let me tell you that in some studies, sloths have been compared with reptiles which are also called cold-blooded because they don't have such a great ability to control their body temperature. They have this limitation where if they are cold, they're going to need to look for some sun. If they're too hot, they're going to look for shade. Uh, so what we do over at Chicken Rescue Ranch, because sloths, indeed, they have the same conundrum that some reptiles have because they don't spend a lot of energy in thermoregulation, well, it turns out that they also look for sun, guys. So quite often in the beginning of the day, 
our sloths go out and take a nice sun bath. <laughs> and you will see that even the roof of our enclosures is partially, uh, is partially open so that these guys, well, if it rains, they have a place where they can get cover. But at the same time, guys, if they want to get some sun, they can go ahead and do so. In the forest, what sloths do is that they climb to the very top of the trees, where, by the way, they're safe from any predators like uh, pumas, jaguars that would be able to prey on a sloth. And they can very effectively um, be able to uh, get warm if they feel a little bit cool. Now, just to get you in context, here we are in the mountains of Costa Rica where it could get a little bit chilly. Uh, so you will notice that we have little buckets for our, sloth, our sloths uh, and we have hammocks. In the wild, sloths, even though they can hang pretty effortlessly from the trees, they tend to sleep with some support. So they'll look for, for example, like a group of lianas to be able to have some support on their back, which is like a little natural hammock. Pringle is a big fan of his hammock, but we also have these buckets and blankets. And believe it or not, our sloths really make use of these buckets and blankets. Here we have Stevie. Let me look for one of our sloths who tucked himself in. Here we go. Here we have Milo. Milo is completely tucked into his little blankets. Why is this so? Maybe he's a little bit chilly and he doesn't feel like go going to get, for get some sun. So they completely wrap themselves up in these blankets and this helps them thermoregulate when maybe there is not enough sun or maybe the sun is just not right for them to be out there uh, sunbathing. Um, However, this is something that is very important for sloths. It even helps them digest their food a little bit better. Um, and something also to understand regarding this adaptation of sloths, regarding how they uh, save up on energy, is that very often they also take a very long time to digest their meals. What Pringle ate today, that little flower that you saw, We'll come through to the other end on approximately uh, a month. Uh, we have known of cases of sloths that take up to uh, two months digesting a meal, uh, which is uh, pretty fascinating. Uh, now, guys, I would also like to head over to, uh, to a place where we have another permanent resident, uh, which is uh, Helga. Helga was actually part of one of our programs called uh, the Sloth Ironman Games. It's a fun fundraising activity that we do every year. And Helga was actually the winner of the Sloth Ironman, of the Sloth Ironman Games. And I'm going to use Helga to explain this digestion story. Because let me tell you something pretty interesting, guys. Uh, sloths actually go to the bathroom once a week or once every two weeks, depending on how quickly their metabolism is going. And they can actually get pretty bloated when they are accumulating all this matter in their intestines. And they actually go down to the bathroom to pee and poo once or up once a week or once every two weeks. So uh, what sloths usually do uh, looks a lot like what Helga is doing. They go to the ground, they hug a tree uh, or a root, and they actually usually have this little position and this little, you know, happy face that Helga has right now. Uh, and of course, they release themselves. This is very peculiar that sloths go down to the ground to pee and poo because that is a moment when they're very much exposed. Like I wouldn't like to be exposed to predators when I'm going to the bathroom. So this is something that really has amazed scientists for a very long time. Why it is that sloths do this. And it turns out, guys, that sloths actually come from a, a group of megafauna, giant, giant mammals that used to roam the American continent that uh, used to pee and poo on the ground. And this could be a characteristic that was handed down by some ancient giant sloths. Let me tell you, some like megatherium were the size of a small elephant. So you can, give, you can have an idea of how big uh, these giant sloths used to be. 
uh, there are other theories as to why or hypotheses as to why sloths do this. Uh, but in reality, we don't really know why, why it is that <laughs> sloths actually do this queer thing. In the case of three finger sloths, they even make a little hole in the ground with a little stub of their tail uh, and they lay their feces in a hole in the ground. Uh, there actually is a very crazy theory that says that maybe um, this has something to do with a group of moths that live on the hair of sloths. Let me tell you guys that the hair of a sloth is like a whole ecosystem on itself. They have um, microalgae, cyanobacteria. They also have ticks, flies, and something very cool that lives in the hair of a sloth are a group of moths that are only found living on the hair of sloths. And they co-evolved uh, with the sloth for thousands of years. And they actually rely on the fact that sloths go to the ground to pee and poo because they lay their eggs on the poop of the sloths on the ground. If it's not that way, that uh, that egg is not going to become a larvae. And the cool thing is that when the larvae becomes a moth, it is going to need to find another sloth that is on the ground to be able to find other moths and continue its life cycle. So it's, there's a very complex relationship there that we don't fully understand. And some people may think that it has something to do with the fact that sloths go to the ground to pee and to poop. Now, there are other very interesting things about the hair. I mentioned that they have microalgae that grows on them, and therefore sometimes sloths can have a really green color. Well, green in nature is the product of photosynthesis. It is the way that uh, the light is reflected on plants due to photosynthesis. So we've had some really green sloths, like uh, so green that we had a three finger sloth we named Hulk to give you an idea. And it turns out that even though our sloths don't look green, we have now discovered that all sloths have this microalgae growing on their hair. And it is as specific to each kind of sloths because there are different kinds of groves on each hair in a sloth, uh, which are like hydroponic gardens that correspond to the right kind of growth for the microalgae to grow on. Uh, and we are doing some very interesting research in Costa Rica regarding the properties of this microalgae. Some that have found that these microalgae species only found on the hair of sloths can have uh, properties that are antiseptic, so they can clean uh, the environment. They can uh, be antifungal, so they can fight uh, fungi, also bacteria. Uh, and there is even research in the University of Costa Rica that is trying to prove that it, they may even have uh, properties that may help in the uh, fight against cancer. <laughs> so, you know, talking about sloths is just uh, an extremely fascinating subject. Now, of course, I would also love to talk uh, a lot, of, actually, about the program that we have, Saving Sloths Together. And also, I would love for us to understand why it is that in Costa Rica, sloths need our help. Sloths in the UECN red list are not categorized as in danger of extinction. However, we receive so many sloths, guys, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, we get a lot of orphans. It's number one reason why we get sloths. But uh, we get a lot of electrocuted sloths also. Uh, sloths that were hit by cars. And also sloths that... Um, were attacked by dogs. And this, guys, is part of our program, Saving Sloths Together. Here we are in the sloth elementary where we have a little friend here called Holly. So let me explain a little bit more as to why Holly is here. So number one reason why we have sloths in Costa Rica, uh, in the uh, Tucan Rescue Ranch, is that we receive orphans like Holly. So why it is that a sloth like Holly could be here? Well, there are a variety of reasons why. Let me tell you that sloths usually have one baby. And in the rare cases where a sloth actually has two babies, it can happen that a sloth abandons a weaker one. Uh, 
However, that is very rare. In many occasions, the slots that we receive are actually here because for some reason, they were abandoned by their mothers and very often the answer as to what happened, why it is that the sloth came here, is simply that uh, the sloth is sick. So 50% of the orphan sloths that we get don't make it back into a while, they don't survive our program because they often have different kinds of conditions, health conditions that wouldn't allow for them to survive in the wild. For example, the case of Pringle that I started <laughs> talking about. So very often, despite all of our efforts, there's not much we could do. Sometimes we don't know the story behind what happened. We've had a few cases. Helga, actually, the sloth that was in the ground, was uh, actually here because the mother of Helga, when she was just a baby, was in trees that got cut down. And uh, she ended up in a barbed wire tangled. And that is why she came. Uh, because her mother abandoned her because of this horrible event. She got scared and, of course, abandoned her baby. But very often we have no clue. Um, very often people find these babies on the ground. Maybe something happened to the mother. Maybe uh, in some cases the sloth couldn't hold on to the mother for some reason. Uh, so it, it is hard working with sloths because they're so cute. And sadly, a lot of them don't make it back into the wild. However, it is definitely worth uh investing on sloths because they are uh creatures that really are very resilient and we've had cases of sloths that were electrocuted that were amputated and we even had a case of a sloth called socorro who uh went back into the trees after being amputated and sadly uh even though she lost her limb she was able to survive and return back out there she returned last year uh, doing very well, uh, clearly thriving without her limb because she actually had a baby. She had a pretty big baby with her, which tells us that sloths are able to survive without a limb. That uh, tells us how resilient they are. Sometimes we are able to rewild sloths that are blind. And because they actually always <laughs> tend to have really, really bad um eyesight it doesn't matter that much because they actually rely heavily heavily on uh their their sense of smell now i would love to show you also um the different stages that we have so right here we're in elementary uh this is a stage where the sloth has gained enough weight to start being a little bit more independent so in elementary they are in these structures. We have leaves, ropes, these little hammocks to make sure that they learn how to sleep properly and not in buckets. And one of the things that we do is that we minimize the interactions that we have with them. And if we have two babies in elementary, they will be together spending time. Uh, and once they uh, move from the stage, they go over to high school, which means that they'll be spending time over in the trees. Uh, to make sure that patients and if they are thriving and acting the way a sloth needs to act, aggressive, um, independent, because sloths are actually uh, solitary, then we will be rewilding them by sending them to Sloth University, which is going to our release site in Nazaret, where they are, will be tracked with radio collars for approximately six uh six months and if everything proves to check out everything is doing good then these animals will be uh rewilded they graduate back into the wild now i'd love to show you a very special phase of our program which is what we call preschool uh or the nursery and right here i'm going to go to one of the places where we keep the smallest babies that come over here to the toucan rescue ranch so we have had babies that are actually premature, and you will see that we have these little buckets over here. Uh, each bucket contains a sloth. And even though some of the youngest baby may have more contact, you know, part of a rewilding program is, again, minimizing that contact that we have with them. Uh, so we keep one sloth in each of these little buckets. And of course, we take uh, really good care of them. And we're always making sure 
that they're doing okay. And at this stage, they need a very, very constant handling. So the buckets are very handy for us to be carrying them because at this stage, they still need to eat milk. We actually just fed our babies. <laughs> so here you can see some of the syringes that we use to give them goat's milk with Pedialyte. And we use these magical nipples over here to make sure that they will suckle on the, uh, the goat's milk and the Pedialyte. And very early on, we start giving them we start giving them also leaps, which is very important. Over here, we have Landon, who has been an amazing case of success. Landon was actually a sloth that was found without having very good control of his limbs. He just wasn't sure where his limbs were uh, in relation to the rest of his body. So he was really bad at climbing. Guys, it has been amazing to see the turnover that Landon has done. We've used laser therapy with him, different kinds of uh, physical therapy. And Landon is starting to look more and more like a normal sloth. And he has gained an amazing ability to be able to climb very slowly, little by little. But at a certain point, we thought that Landon couldn't be rewilded. And at this stage where we are now, we are very, very positive that if he continues on this path, soon he will be able to continue the Saving Slots Together program. So those are great news for us. Steph, this is just spectacular. And what an adorable baby slot to end on with our, our main part of our broadcast. But I'm really excited that you're good to go to dive in with our Kahoot and then all our questions with our classes from all over the world. Does that sound good? Hopefully. Steph, are you good to go for Kahoot and things? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'll pull that up for folks now. Uh, quite a few of you are already in, which is spectacular. We're going to leave up our baby sloth friends on the side of the screen, and Steph can help us out with these questions. Uh, for those who are new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Now, you don't win anything, but you do win Steph and I's everlasting respect, which I think is pretty worth something. So we're going to dive in in a sec, get underway, and then I'm going to come to Ms. Caggiano's class for our first question. Uh, everyone's going to get some questions today, so don't worry. I promise I'm coming to you all. Uh, but we are going to get started in just a second and, and do this thing. So... Thanks, everybody. All these names pouring in. So many of you set to play. Uh, don't worry. Just get in as soon as you can, and we will start this thing. Here we go, everybody. Okay. Our Toucan Rescue Ranch Kahoot begins in three, two, one. First question. True or false? Sloths make great pets. Everybody should have a sloth. They're adorable, right? Mm, I don't know. Maybe not. We'll make sure we cover this in a little more detail after the, the Kahoot is done too. Most of you have your answers in. You got 10 more seconds. Get those answers in everybody. All right, five, four, three, two, one. And there will be a little leaderboard if you haven't done one of these before in a second. But the answer is false. Sloths do not make great pets. Steph, can you explain just briefly why sloths are not uh, a good thing for a pet for people? Absolutely, Jesse. Well, guys, if you remember, I was telling you just how slow the metabolism of a, slow, of a sloth is. It turns out, guys, that when a sloth is kept as a pet, they are under constant stress. And remember how I told you guys that sloths are solitary. They're not going to be spending time even with other sloths. Imagine the stress a sloth would feel if this giant primate, because they have no notion that we are a human, that they are a pet, is they're constantly holding them, petting them. When this happens, and sloths sadly are becoming popular pets, these animals are under constant stress all the time. And this means that they may often die from heart attacks. In the case of three finger sloths, you won't even see them in zoos. They don't do well in captivity and they often die from the stress of captivity. So it's worth noting, too, that at the Toucan Rescue Ranch, if people go to visit, you're not petting the sloths, you're not all picking up or hugging the sloths. In fact, one of the ways that I know we've talked about with you guys before, that all the kids in this program can help out, is if you're at home, if you're liking social media posts, only like posts where it's animals are being cared for properly. Places like the Toucan Rescue Ranch, where it's the highest standard of animal care. If you see pictures of people with sloths on their heads, or they're, they're riding animals, or they're touching animals in a way that they probably shouldn't, make sure not to like and reshare those posts, because it just encourages people to do those sorts of activities, which can really negatively impact the animal. So I'm really glad we, we got that answer in, and uh, most of you got it right. 
So let's go to our second question now. How often do sloths climb down to go to the bathroom? So Steph mentioned this uh, halfway through our broadcast. Is it five times daily, once a day, once a week, or once a year? I don't know. One of those seems like a little too long, maybe. 60 answers in so far. Then I promise after this Kahoot, we will go back to seeing some baby sloths uh, as we take your questions. But most of you got this right. 61 of you. Holy of the 65. That's fantastic. Let's see if it changes our leaderboard. Mighty Emu now in the lead as we go to question number three. Let's head on to that. Sloth eyesight isn't very good, but they have a very good sense of dot, dot, dot. We did cover this very early in the program today. Is it taste, hearing, smell, or touch? Do sloths have super ears? Can they taste better than most creatures? Can they smell better than they can see? Or are they very good at they can identify things by touch? The answer is, of course, smell, which almost all of you got this right too. Steph, this is like a really smart audience today. You guys are amazing. Way to go. Mighty Emu takes a continues with our lead just barely as we go into our final question. And then Miss Gaggiano, we're going to Sierra Vista in a minute for our first question. So this is at the beginning. The Toucan Rescue Ranch is in what super biodiverse country? Is it Panama, Colombia, Costa Rica, or Brazil? Dun, 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 dun. This may or may not be a picture from that country. A very special place to visit if anyone gets the chance. And in fact, we're doing three programs this month with Joe, who's visited Costa Rica, which is where our rescue ranch is. Way to go, everybody. So let's check our podium, and then we're heading to Arizona in just a sec. Miss Lewis, you'll be our second class in any of our YouTube classes. You can type in questions and we'll take as many as we can as well. So did our emu friend win? Let's see. Da, 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 da. Mighty emu, way to go. If you are any of these people, let us know who you are in the chat. We'd love to have a sense of who, who won our Kahoot today. But let's head to Sierra Vista for our first question with our Toucan crew. Come on in, Miss Gagione's class, and uh, unmute your mic and share away. Hey, guys. <laughs> hello, hello. Come on, you have a question. Hi, guys. <laughs> no, Ava and Millie for right now. Hold on. How many questions do we get to ask? One right now, but I will come back. Okay, so Millie, go ahead. Hey, Millie. Uh, how, sloths, how slow do sloths go? How slow, how slow do they go, Steph? <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, let me tell you that even though they often don't move, when they want to be fast, they can go as fast as you run on the ground. They can move uh, pretty quickly. I once read a reference that on average, they usually go like 0 0.2 miles per hour, which I know it's not a lot, <laughs> but uh, it's just to give you a reference. We've had a program before. I know Andrea was uh, filming that one, and the sloth was sort of chasing her along the ground, and it was it was going pretty good clip. It's a very funny episode we did with you guys. Uh, <laughs> let's head to Ms. Lewis's class. Uh, if you guys want to come on in in Fullerton, California, you are good to go. Hey, guys. Give a little wait. Go ahead, Lily. Um, how many hours do sloths take saving energy per day? Yeah, how often are they sleeping or resting, Steph? Great question. And let me tell you something that I didn't mention before, guys. Uh, sloths are more nocturnal in uh, the case of the two-finger sloth and more diurnal in the case of the three-finger sloth. Before, people used to think that sloths could sleep 20 hours in a 24-hour period. But now, we know that sloths usually sleep from 10 to 15 hours in a 24-hour period. The thing is that in the case of the two finger sloth, you will be seeing them more active at night than during the day. And this is what led to confusions. However, they stay still a big part of the day, saving up on energy in general. Nice. All right, Miss Collins and uh, our other class, Ryan Beck, New York, we're coming to you, our, our double feature class. Hi, fifth graders. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How many different colors do the sloths come in and what are those colors? Ooh, good question. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if we're talking about this species, the Hoffman's two-finger sloth, you will often see them in tones of brown. So, they could be pretty blonde, like a very uh, yellowish kind of blonde uh, color. And we can also see them in this really dark tone of brown. So, you will see, for example, in Landon's case, his face is a little bit blonder than the rest of his extremities. Um, but we also have the three-finger sloth, which... We're actually in luck because our friends here are being fed right now by Giselle. 
three finger sloths usually have different tones of gray. So you'll see that uh, it is quite different than the brown that you just saw. And they can be darker or sometimes have these really clear areas of gray, almost white. And in the case of males, they have something in the back called speculum, which is a line, a black line that has this orangey color. Also, three finger sloths have this little mask on their faces, which can be pretty black. That's adorable. We haven't seen one of those in a long time. Look at our beauty. Right. <laughs> Now, no hot pink sloths, though, or yellow sloths for any kids that are keen on that, unfortunately, but they are just <laughs> a glorious creature. Ms. Avery, I will come to you guys in your uh, virtual school. If you turn on your camera, I'll make sure you're there and good to go with a question, but we will head to Surrey, BC, for Miss T's Chips first. Come on in and take us away, guys. Hey. Here. How do sloths get grip on branches? Yes, good question. Ooh, excellent question, guys, and we actually have a uh, little Coco here that is trying to trying to get a grip on a branch. So let me explain something by showing you how Coco here is trying to grip on the branch. You will see that sloths have this bare pad of skin uh, underneath their hands. This gives them better grip. So it's this little area underneath where she's grabbing the branch. And she has these really big claws, in the case of two finger sloths, just two of them. And they have this mechanism where as they grab the, the branch, it's as if it kind of locks in. Their articulations have this mechanism where when they grab something, it locks in the branch or the structure that they are trying to grab. And the other key mechanism through which sloths are able to grab branches and live hanging from trees is that they have very strong abductor muscles, which is the muscles that you use to be able to pull uh, yourself. Um, it, the retractor muscles are not as strong, so they are very good at just hanging from the branches <laughs> for long periods of time. And finally, there is another very interesting mechanism that sloths have to be able to hang because it is an effort that they need to do. When we do, for example, pull-ups, <laughs> I, I cannot do one, I don't have any upper body strength, but when we do pull-ups, we accumulate lactic acid very quickly, so our muscles get tired. The way the muscles of the sloths are irrigated by blood doesn't allow for them to accumulate lactic acid the way we do, so they can make force for long periods of time without getting tired the way we do with our muscles. Very, very cool. You actually answered a question from YouTube as well. So Joanna's class, thank you for that on, on YouTube as well. But lots of sort of physiological mechanisms to make sure that it's not a challenge for them to hang the way it would necessarily be for us. So very cool stuff. Um, Miss Landry, again, if you want to turn on your camera, we can come to you for a question. But I will go back to Miss Caggiano's class. So Arizona, come on back in. We'll do another round with everyone because we are whipping through these folks. Come on in, Sierra Vista. Toucan crew. Hey, guys. <laughs> um. Ava, come on. Hey, Ava. My camera has to be all the way over here, and they're all the way over there. <laughs> That's out the front. It's really, it's a, there we go. You get a big walk up entrance that way. Hi, Ava. <laughs> Hi. How deadly are their claws? How deadly are their claws, Steph? Tell us. More. Ooh, I love that question <laughs> because a lot of people don't realize just how strong a sloth is. Um, to give you an idea of their strength and how deadly a uh, claw is, let me start by telling you an interesting factoid. As soon as a sloth is born, they're able to pull their whole body weight with just one hand. I cannot even do it with two, let alone one. And to give you an idea of what we have been through with the sloth's claws, let me tell you that they can be extremely, extremely strong. When we need to do procedures on sloths, Sometimes we need up to uh, four to five people holding adult sloths in order for us to be able to do procedures on them safely. So the problem with the sloth's claws is that uh, besides the fact that they are very big, very sharp, is that they have a huge amount of retractile strength. So if a sloth pulls you in with one of their claws, they will get those claws into your skin. They will pull you in and also bite you. And believe me, a, an adult sloth is much stronger than one person. Yeah, 
this is one thing that I always find fascinating, regardless of the animal you, people are real weaklings as far as animals go. Pretty much every animal, including things like a sloth, you think would be so small and not have near that much strength, are really, really muscular per size of them. So uh, I, I love the, the note about four people needed to help do one procedure on one sloth. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to take a quick one from YouTube, and then we're going to head to Miss Lewis's class. Uh, Miss Bogren's class wants to know, how long do sloths live? Great question. So no one has ever followed a sloth from life from the moment it is born to death. So in the wild, we're not that sure. But what I can tell you is what we know from sloths that uh, are in captivity. So in the case of two-finger sloth, as I mentioned, three-finger sloths do very badly in captivity. They often die very quickly. But two-finger sloths uh, can live quite a while in captivity. So in on average, you can say from 30 to 35 years would be a normal lifespan for a two-finger sloth in captivity, be it Hoffman's two-finger sloth or Lina, uh, or um, Linnaeus two-finger sloth. But there is a world record right now in a zoo in Germany from a uh, Linnaeus two-finger sloth. So it's a different species than the one that you're seeing. It's Coleopodidactylus. Uh, that sloth currently is about 52 years old <laughs> and he's still having babies. So sloths can actually live longer than we actually expected, thanks to this uh, data from Yan. Yeah, very, very cool. Thanks, Steph. All right, Ms. Lewis's class, heading back to California. We'll do two more questions after that before wrapping up. Right. How can you tell if a sloth's a girl or boy? Good question. Mm, I love it. So, guys, it is pretty tricky with two-finger sloths because two-finger sloths don't have what we call sexual dimorphism, which means that males and females look identical. Their organs are internal. Uh, so, in order for us to know, vets can tell because males have a little bit of a bump in the genital area that females don't have but if you don't have a trained eye it can be tricky even for vets sometimes once they check the internal organs they're like oh surprise we thought it was a male and it was a female <laughs> it happens but in the case of three finger sloths yeah. not when they're babies but in any case when they are adults they look exactly the same except for the speculum so as these babies become adults on their back, they're going to have an area here, which if they are males, it is going to have a black line and it can become very orangey on the side. So through the speculum, you can tell males from females apart in the case of three finger sloths. Very, very cool. I guess the closest thing that a lot of students might be familiar with is like a silver back on a gorilla where you know that that's the male because he's got the silver back. Very, very cool. Oh, we're being reached out at. Hello, Sloth. <laughs> uh, we're going to head to New York and then BC to wrap up in just a sec. I want to note for everyone, when you're done this program, check out toucanrescueranch.org. So much more to learn and discover there when you're done. Um, but for now, let's head to Ms. Collins and Ms. Darling's class. Hi, fifth graders. Hello. Um, How long are the females pregnant for? Yeah, good question. Great question. So it's different, again, with three finger and two finger sloths. In the case of uh, three finger sloths, the gestation period can be shorter. Uh, so from eight to 10 months would be a normal gestation period. In the case of two finger sloths, it can be longer than humans. There are cases of uh, two finger sloths that have been known to have pregnancies that have gone up to 12 months. So that is longer than humans. Wow. By the way, thank you for answering all these questions with nuance for the two different species. And by the way, great questions from classes today. You guys are really detailed. That's some great research. Um, let's head to Surrey to wrap up. Miss T's champs, come on in for one final question. Oh, you got, where are you? There you are. You are. <laughs> How many teeth can a sloth have? How many teeth, Steph? Ooh, ah, <laughs> you got me there on one that I'm not 100% sure of, but I actually have a way to know because if you want to check out something pretty cool, we actually have a skull of a sloth right here. So I'm just going to 
run over so you actually can see the teeth of a sloth live right now. And before I tell you that, just quick interesting fact about teeth, since we are talking about them, uh, sloths actually lack the enamel that we have, so that can give them a pretty black color. So here we are in our ad center, and check this out, guys. We have the skull of a uh, three-finger sloth right here, and you will see right here, you can count one, two, three, four so eight on the mandible one two three four five on top and something pretty interesting is that these teeth are used for grinding uh leaves so they're pretty flat whereas in the case of two finger sloths you'll see that they have these really big caniform form teeth that three finger sloths don't have Steph, thank you so much for taking the effort to run across the area and, and <laughs> the today. That was very, very cool. Um, this has been such a fun program. Some of the best questions I've seen in one of these classes uh, in a long time. I know we've got a big new audience today, so it's been really spectacular having you. If you want to check out this program, share it with your family and friends. Check out the link below. I'll make sure all our teachers have these links uh, in an email in just a minute. <laughs> in rescueranch.org too. Steph. As you know, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teacher friends and say a big thank you and farewell. So, Miss Caggiano, Miss Lewis, Miss Collins, Miss Darling, Miss East Champs, thank you thank so you. much. Bye. Bye, guys. It was a pleasure having you all. Bye.